This is Mike Meredith, the doctor of Doctors Woodshop. I get a lot of questions about the uh, Alumalite wood hybrid blanks that I use, and I thought I'd show you how to make them today. No cracks about how messy my shop is. I get enough of that from my wife. The first part of producing the wood Alumalite resins is to stabilize the wood. Now, the stabilization of the wood is done in a vacuum chamber like this or like this one, or I actually have one that's about a 20 gallon vacuum chamber, but I'm going to do, the, do it in this one because you can see the bubbles a little bit better. Um, you need a vacuum chamber, you need a vacuum pump, like this one, and you need something to stabilize the wood. Now to stabilize the wood, I use the cactus juice um, resin. Uh, it's produced by Curtis Seebeck down there in Texas, and everything in Texas has got to be a longhorn or a cactus. Uh, this is taken into the wood as the air is relieved, removed from the wood, and then this is a heat-activated polymerizing agent that hardens the wood and increases the, um, the ability of the alumilite to stick to it. Now, this is the piece that we're going to make the, um, the bottle stopper out of. And it's a piece of uh, maple burl that I've cut to fit into the mold. It doesn't really need to be stabilized, but what it does need to be is dry. And in addition to drying in the oven, the uh, polymerizing resin will extract some water uh, during the process. Now, other things in here, we have some very nice, very punky, spalted maple uh, that will be um, uh, stabilized very nicely and uh, rendered into uh, turnable materials as opposed to the sort of bundle of newspaper that they are now. So to stabilize the wood, put them inside the, the chamber. This is a, a piece of lead that's been coated with rubber that sits right down on top of everything and keeps it from floating away. We then cover the wood with the cactus juice. Now any cactus juice that's not absorbed into the wood can be reused. So we need to cover it, cover the wood very nicely, and then draw the vacuum um, on the chamber. Now we got a vacuum gauge on this one. On the back side of this is a valve. Now I will leave the valve open during the entire stabilization process, but I use the valve to keep it from foaming too aggressively um, during the uh, during the, the degassing. So we'll turn the pump on. You can see the, the air coming out of the wood and when it looks like it's going to foam up to the top I'll, I'll cut the vacuum for a moment, let it settle down. Just kind of keep opening and closing, reducing the vacuum until the bulk of the air gets out of the wood. And then I can open it to the full vacuum. You can see over here, we're drawing, oh, right now, just barely 20 uh, inches of mercury. When I open the valve, you'll see that mercury, the um, the vacuum move on toward uh, the high 20s. Really 20, 20 inches of mercury is enough vacuum to uh, evacuate the woods for uh, stabilization. You can see that the vacuum gauge has gotten up to about 25 inches of mercury and the valve is now completely open. So we'll just let it sit. About an hour has elapsed and the bubbles as you saw uh, have pretty well subsided. So I'll close the valve, turn the pump off, disconnect the vacuum line and then evacuate the chamber. 
So you notice how much the, the level went down? It dropped about oh, three-eighths of an inch or so. That's the, the um, cactus juice being sucked into the wood uh, by the uh, removed air. Next, we need to uh, remove the chips, or remove the pieces, and get them ready. The pieces can now be removed and placed onto this rack to get the drying process started. Now the cactus juice is not particularly dangerous, although I will go wash my hands um, as soon as I get this done. As you can see, there's our little piece of big leaf maple. It's going to grow go into the um, um, the bottle stopper. You can see that the the uh, stabilization accentuates the grain and figure uh, very significantly. Now, people that stabilize uh, pen blanks will very often wrap each piece into uh, a little individual sleeve of aluminum foil. I don't do that. I just let it drain out onto this sheet of aluminum foil as it sits in my oven. Which is set to about um, 180 degrees. Time has passed. It's been about four hours. It probably didn't take that long for the, um, the resin to be extruded and to set up, but I got busy doing other things. So we can see here that our, our stabilized pieces now have been Im embedded with the cactus juice. Um, and what I'll do with our little piece of maple burl is I will sand off the bottom to flatten it and to get rid of the extra uh, cactus juice, clean it, and then we'll be ready to actually uh, cast it in the alumilite. Alright, now that our piece of wood is, is sanded down ready to put into the mold, we need to set up the mold. Now, this is the type of mold that I've used. This is um, plexiglass held together with solvent and then um, a gasketed end to put on held in place with screws so that you can just undo the, the screws on the end and slip it out. First thing we have to do is, is clean all the, any of the dust off of our wooden piece and just a little brass brush does a pretty good job of that. And finally the mold, clean off the, the, uh, the piece, and I'm going to coat the mold with a mold release. That lets the cast piece uh, slip out of it. Now, aluminite is not cheap. It's about 40 cents a cubic inch. So I take up as much room as I'm going to need. Um, this is a mold that's made to make three, but three of the stopper blanks, but this piece of wood is really only going to be for two. So put that in there in place. Um, I think I'm probably going to use a piece of tape to hold this in place um, on the other side. There. Yeah, I think that's how I want it. Okay, so now the question becomes, how much alumilite do we actually need to make up? Well, I know that the dimension of this, and since I put my spacer block in, I've got this irregular space to fill up. Well, I calculate that by using glass beads. You could use rice or just about any small
small solid that would fit into a space. You just fill that off with the glass beads, pour them into a graduated cylinder, measure the volume they took up, and they took up about uh, 165 mils of space, 165 cubic centimeters of space. So that's sort of a, a guideline for how much alumilite I need to make up. Now alumilite comes in all sorts of quantities. I buy it by the gallon and then work uh, pour into working containers from these gallon jugs. It comes as an A and a B side and I use what's called the alumilite clear. There are several different formulations of alumilite. This is the one that uh, seems to work the best for me. Um, when we're getting ready to, to cast a piece, we know that we need about 170 mils of alumilite. I always make more than I need. In fact, I'm going to make about 185. So we have half of that is B, half of that is A. Now we need to add the color. Now, I, I, over the years in the lab, I've learned to work from liquid stocks. And that's how I started doing this. I know that if I've made up a, a, a quantity of a liquid that, that produces a desirable result, it's easier to handle a liquid than it is to weigh out a powder every time. So for these stoppers, I'm going to use what I call my standard C stopper. It's a mixture of standard blue and standard green. Standard to me means 500 drops of the alumilite dye in 500 mils of, of part A. And I know that I want a about a 1 to 60 dilution. So we got 180. Um, 1 to 10 would be 18 mils, 18 grams. Um, 1 to 60 would be a sixth of that, or about 3 grams of my standard C green into uh, my A stock. Now the alumilite is a very thick, sticky stuff, and it doesn't pipette all that well, but it's still better than trying to weigh out small quantities. And even though I need about 3 grams, it's probably going to be best if I come up a little bit short and add more stock to uh, my final mixture. This is a mixing stick. Actually, it, it's from a, a company called Sky Geeks that makes everything in the world for airplane maintenance. What it is is just a really large tongue depressor. Um, it's polished and sanded wood. That allows me to mix very thoroughly on a wooden surface, with a wooden surface. Just like a tongue depressor, except big enough to actually do the, the large volume mixing. Right, now there's my A with color. Now what's going to happen here is going to, have, is going to happen fairly quickly. Um, I will mix these, and once they're mixed, you've got about seven or eight minutes with the Alumilite Clear to get it in the pressure pot. So things need to move kind of fast once I start mixing things. Uh, I need to make sure I've got my piece of tape ready to go to hold my wood in place. I need to have my pressure pot open and ready to receive the mold, and we'll show you that in just a little bit. But let's go ahead and, and mix that, pour this, and get ready to um, harden the alumilite resin in the pressure pot. So we'll stir the B into the colored A. And this stuff is, is very sticky, so you got to make sure you get every bit of it out. And you got to make sure that you have it mixed thoroughly. Uh, you can see the waves within the, the mixture. Uh, I have two very viscous solutions 
that need to be stirred together until there's no more disturbance, no more um, obvious mixing lines within the glass. Now you can also see that there are uh, a lot of bubbles coming out. Those bubbles are why the casting stage really needs to be done in a pressure pot. Uh, at a pressure of, of about 60 pounds per square inch, those bubbles go back into solution and you wind up with a nice clear alumilite block. Okay, now that looks free of, of the mixing waves. You can still see the, um, the bubbles coming out of it. And I think I want to put just a touch of green, more of green in this. So I have a, a standard green. That I will pick up just a bit of. Yeah, okay. The reason I use the Illumilite dyes is the color saturation is amazingly good. Plus the mixing of colors is very, very reproducible. Um, if I know the endpoints of a color mixture, if I want something in the middle, I can literally just calculate a midpoint and probably come pretty close. Okay. Let's go ahead and pour that. My mold is a little bit bigger than the one and a half inch block that I want in the stopper. So there'll be a little bit at the top that sits open. Okay, there's our blank ready to go to the pressure pot. You can see my pressure pot, which is really just an old painter's um, spray pot. We put the, the mold inside. Screw down the ears here. Although that seven minutes seems like a long time, it always takes you longer to get things set up than you think it's going to. So you need to have everything pretty much ready to go when you put that aluminum light into the mold. Okay. Retrieve my compressor hose here. And you can hear it filling up the pot.
up to 60 pounds. Let it sit. And we'll be back in a couple of hours to see what the uh, casting looks like. Once again, time passes and we're ready to remove the um, hopefully hardened alumilite blank from the uh, pressure pot. And there it is. And there's the uh, stopper blank, ready to be trimmed and prepared for turning. And a quick trip to the table saw, trimming these down to one and a half by one and a half by about two and a half. Um, our Alumalite Big Leaf Maple Burl hybrids are ready to turn. I have queued up here one of the uh, Alumalite and uh, Maple Burl hybrid blanks for a bottle stopper. It's threaded onto the the bolt holder that's been trapped in the the draw collet and as you can see I've got it started rounding out. The Alumalite is um, cuts very delicately once you get it roughed out but in the roughing process a face guard is always a good idea. The problem with a hybrid blank like this is that the alumilite, although you can cut it, it really prefers to be scraped. The wood, although it's been embedded with plastic and cactus juice, prefers to be cut. So you wind up going back and forth between you know, reduction methods and, and uh, you try not to forget which is which.
Okay, so we'll clear away the um, plastic strands and start sanding. The sanding for one of these is done exactly the same as uh, with a wooden blank. We start with the, um, the Clinx 4 paper and then move up into the, um, the wet dry papers. Now just to start sanding, I'm going to start with about an 80 grit, which is coarser than I would normally use, in part because the alumilite in the roughing stage tends to come off in chunks. And there are some small little divots here that we just need to get past before we start doing anything. Even at 80 grit, you can use a sanding lubricant to keep the dust down. And you can definitely see the burnishing compound forming on this one. Jump to 220. Still actually finishing up some shaping details. A little light as a material is very interesting. It sands pretty much at the same rate the wood does. And it behaves with sanding uh, very much as wood does. So it's a good choice for the wood plastic hybrids. Much better, I think, than acrylic, which is much more brittle than wood. Mm -hmm. Alumilite is a polyphenoxy as opposed to a polyacrylic resin. And in my as yet limited experience, it behaves a lot better than uh, the acrylic resins. By that, I mean, I mean it simply behaves more like wood. through the clings for cloth back. J Wade shop rolls. Okay, before we go on, let's clear the sanding residue. Now, although the wood has been preserved, it still benefits from embedding the oil into the surface. Now, you can see even at 600, we've produced a, a fairly nice look on the, um, the alumilite. And by the time we're done, that will look like we're standing on a cliff looking down into an orange sea of some sort. So we're ready to start with a wet dry paper. The wonderful thing about the alumilite resins with the um, well, maple burl in this case, but we've also done buckeye burl, is that the prettiest part of the burl is right at the surface. That's the part you can never keep. You always wind up turning that away in your project. With these hybrid blanks, we're actually turning to the prettiest parts. So we preserve um, the best part of the burl as a focal point of the blank. 1,000, 
When I first started working with the Illumilite resin, suddenly I heard the voice of my seventh grade shop teacher, Mr. Clark, who said, you always wet sand plastic. So I started using my finishing oil as a wet sand and it works very well. It actually behaves again very wood-like, but it allows us to sand faster because the Illumilite will melt if the sanding isn't lubricated. So there, Mr. Clark, I was awake and I was paying attention. Now the wood is really pretty much done by the time we get up to this is, looks like 2,500 or 3,000. But the, the Illumilite prospers from the additional sand. It looks pretty good at 1,000 but the additional clarity you get by sanding through the rest of the grits is well worth the few minutes it's going to take to do it. And with Illumilite, as with wood, surface is everything. Take the time to perfect the surface and you'll never regret how the piece looks. All right, 5,000 and clean it off. Pretty nifty. We'll finish it with uh, Pens Plus microcrystal uh, walnut oil shellac finish. More for the wood than the alumilite, but the alumilite seems to benefit from the wax. Again, it's like any other friction polish. And again, just a little spot of the micro crystal wax, paste wax as a finishing top coat. Again, more for the alumilite than the wood, but. So now all I have to do is mount it on the base. You just screw in the base. There we are. A maple burl alumilite uh, resin blank. Blank produced by Beyond Wood Products in St. Louis. Very dramatic. You can see that more time has passed, and I've spared you the details of turning the, the uh, bottle stopper. There's another video on YouTube that shows how I do this. But we're at the last stage. This has been sanded using the walnut oil as a sanding lubricant up through about 7,000 grit with wet, dry sandpaper. Um, it's already got a beautiful finish on it, but if you want to go a little bit further, there are some things that you can do to... Um, give it a little higher luster or, or better shine. Of course there's the, the standard buffing. Um, Tripoli, silver, di uh, white diamond, and wax. Tripoli is not a particularly fine abrasive. Uh, if you sand it to 7,000, a, a, a P, P scale of 7,000 grit, you've already bypassed the ability of Tripoli to, uh, to shine. White diamond is a finer abrasive, and of course the wax wheel is not going to give you an abrasive treatment. There are ways, though, to get 
higher grade abrasives into the process, and that's using either pumice, a 4F fine, or rotten stone. And the easiest way to use these is to make a paste wax uh, abrasive carrier. Now I'm going to use the rotten stone for this one, and it's really simple. A paper towel, uh, a paste wax, this is the Doctor's Woodshop Walnut Oil Micro Crystal Wax. Pick up some wax on the towel and shake on just a little bit of the rotten stone powder in this case. At least it's uh, pumice. And we'll do another course with the rotten stone. And simply polish the surface with the wax mixture. With the 4F fine pumice, that'll give you a grit equivalent to what would be about a 10,000 grit sandpaper. If we want to do the rotten stone, we pick up a little bit more of the wax, shake out the rotten stone onto the, the paper towel, sort of mix it up, back to the piece. And that's really about all it takes to finish a, uh, a very high gloss, high luster finish on the, uh, the surface of the, of the resin material. Um, the idea of using an abrasive with the wax is nothing new. There probably aren't that many original ideas in uh, um, most things anyway. Um, it was not my idea actually, Bill Hall, who taught the class on Native American flutes that I took, showed me the use of abrasives in a, a liquid or a wax medium. Um, but this works really well. It's inexpensive, it's fast, it's very easy. Um, trust me, I really am a doctor. <laughs>